Podcast. I'm Tom Nato. I'm your host tonight. Um, joined with Brent Salisbury and Kyle Mestri. Our buddy, Mr. Tucker, can't make it today. And uh, we're joined again by our esteemed guest, Corey Brindle, uh, who's going to be talking to us about a uh, second part from last week about uh, the, the challenges and, and progress that, that he's been making uh, around um, broadband fiber access for uh, for the for the greater Colorado area. Welcome back to the show, Corey. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to be here with you guys again. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for, for sure. being on. So we were going to um, carry on from where we ended up last week. So for folks listening, um, please go back and listen to the last episode if you haven't, um, where we give a, a really get into a really good uh, lineup for where we're going to uh, take off today, which is we've been focusing on uh, the, the, the sort of transport fiber access and how that's been um, pushed out. But let's, let's look at an example today. We're going to go into detail about how Corey's actually implementing this and how joining that to the local broadband setup and, and so on is part of the uh, recipe for the success of this thing. So take it away, Corey. Yeah, so so Tom, I ought to kind of just do a quick review just to, to catch anybody up to speed. And you know, the first cool. thing is that we've built this, or we're in the process of building this fiber ring around the western half of Colorado. It's basically the blue lines that you see there. We're by the way, for to... folks that are listening, you want, check out the YouTube version, to, and you'll see Corey's slides uh, that he's projecting. Yep, yeah, it'll definitely go into more detail there. And the idea is to build fiber around in that ring topology that the blue line is. You know, ultimately we want to increase the capacity with DWDM equipment and at the end get out, get our communities connected to places that either have sources of content or better upstream services available. So, so how do we do that from a community level? Um, the first thing is I, I use this town of Palisade. It's, it's sitting up near Grand Junction. Um, they, they've been around for quite a while. Um, it's a very old town. It's a little under 3,000 people. And uh, the, the town of Palisade has a median household income of just about half, a little under half of the state's average. Um, its closest town of 50,000 people or more, which would see material investment from the usual suspects, the cable co, the telco, that type of thing, is 181 miles away in Boulder, Colorado. Even though Grand Junction is right there, it's not of sufficient size to have that that large and between here and there there's handfuls of people right i mean that's that's the sparseness right yeah yeah there's definitely distance between the communities and the communities are generally smaller along the way so so i guess the net of it is they're not going to see a material investment from the cable co or the telco um and uh we we take the town of palisade and uh the first thing is we, we need to get access to long haul fiber whether that fiber is it being installed along the highway by a commercial company or it um, needs to be constructed by us. We, we will affect that construction if we need to. Um, or we will we'll go ahead and buy access through an IRU or a capitalized lease to fiber if it exists. In this case, uh, a large national company was working on a route from Chicago to the West Coast for high frequency trading, a very high performance route. And they came through Colorado. And in doing that, um, they traded with our Department of Transportation access to the right-of-way for the right to install their infrastructure. And in doing that, it gave us kind of two options. It gave us the ability to buy some fiber from that private company, and it gave us some ability to work with the Department of Transportation if the policies support um, access to the to their fiber as well. So that, that that's fiber... one thing, like for folks listening, I wanted to point out, you brought this up last time too, because I'm mentioned I'm work, I'm on the cable committee in my local town and um the the interesting thing is what you're talking about I mean these things are accessible to, you know at your state level in in North America um but you have to know and for example on the cable committee thing I've been working on people are the rest of the folks on the committee are completely unaware of what you're just talking about that access to right away is 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 very feasible um you just have to you know, take the approach Corey's been talking about. Yeah, in, in this case, it's actually quite expensive um, and it's time consuming. The, the agreement to get that cable into the right away, just the negotiation for that took that private company two years of, of working through attorneys and, 
and folks with the Department of Transportation to, to get to the point where they could begin construction. Um, and then it took them a while to perform the construction and ultimately they're in the process of of turning over some asset to the state and, and they have the asset available um, through the private company today. Now, now it's interesting, you see the fiber go along the highway and you think, gosh, I can automatically, you know, get, get access to it, right? I just call someone yeah. and check and, and it's it's available. And, and really that's not the case. Not it, necessarily, it does take, right. Uh, it takes some work. Um, you know, they intended to go from Chicago to San Francisco basically and did not intend to break out at small communities along the way. So stranding that fiber is a very difficult decision for a company that's built a route. We're talking about basically a little under 300 miles of fiber here along a route that's several thousand long. So, mm -hmm. so that's a, a big decision for them and they don't, they don't take it lightly and it comes with some additional cost as well. Um, and what, what, what you're talking about too, for folks that aren't clear is, is uh, some sort of physical facility that can have shared access, which is a lot like what you're building, but along the fiber path, you know, where, where people can jump in and, 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 uh, you know, get, get onto one of the strands or one of the, one of the lambdas, right? Yeah. So, so we're looking for access to dark fiber specifically, um, yeah. because then we can generate capacity and we can go places that, that change the game. So, so if we can't buy access to an existing route like this one, we will go ahead and find the funding and actually construct the route. And we've done that in several places. Um, we've done that for 47 miles between Montrose and, and Ure, Colorado. Went through some really difficult mountain terrain to get down and start to complete a loop through the San Juan Mountains. Um, so how did you do that? How did you actually, do you, you had to hire all the construction and everything or how does that work? Yep, we, we first is the funding and the project plan uh, to come up with the, basically local funding as well as some federal funding and, and we have state funding that supports our projects as well. Um, and then to do the easement perfection, to, to get in and, and get access to the land. Um, it's very expensive to go along these Department of Transportation right of ways. So in that case, we used county roads and um, worked with the counties and private landowners to get hundreds of easements. And at the end of the day, we hired a firm and they performed the construction and they've also been hired on to do the O&M for the line going forward. So we'll get up to 300 locates a year on that 47 mile route. And is um, that, that company you hired, is they, are they, they specialize in laying fiber or are they just a construction place that can dig conduits and, I mean, dig, you know, dig trenches and put conduits and pull yeah, the cable or whatnot? They're a fiber specific construction company. So they'll do aerial fiber and underground fiber. And in this case, they were hired to put in uh, three conduits and pull a cable through one of them. And that, that got us basically 144 strand cable for 47 miles all the way down into Ure, Colorado, which is the Switzerland of America, right? <laughs> um, one of the most mountainous areas in the San Juans. And it it really was a game changer. The ISPs down there, we have two fiber of the home ISPs competing for customers in, in several of those communities. And, as, and the WISPs are able to, to take in larger capacity. So, so I guess the net of it is if we can't, we want to buy access to existing fiber, that's always preferential. It's quicker, easier, much, much easier when someone else is maintaining the cable. But if we can't do that, we will construct it. I have another route similar to this um, down where we have four partners. We have the Southern Ute Indian tribe. Mm -hmm. We have La Plata County, Archuleta County. So two counties. Um, an electric association, La Plata Electric Associ Association and Region 10, my organization, the five of us have partnered together to build about a 50, no, 60, 65 mile route to connect Pagosa Springs, which is in the, the Southern San Juans to Durango. And that, that goes through Southern Ute territory and it, it's just a game changer for those communities along the way. So, so if we can't buy access to it, we will construct it. And, and once we've done the construction, we need to get off the highway um, into the town. So here we build a lateral fiber. This is just a connector, comes from the highway. So we have an east and a west route along the highway. We always look for dual paths. So if we have a mudslide on one side or a fire or a construction event on the other, we can get traffic out. Um, and as that lateral comes down into town, if it's underground, we have handholds. If it's aerial, we have splice cases on the poles. Depends on what the community wants. Um, what, what do you mean is by handholds? With um, they're basically a fiber, a fiber cement vault in the ground. Um, it's it's usually about two feet wide by a foot and a half, or two feet long by a foot and a half wide, 
And the fiber comes along the, the conduit and it's curled up in the vaults and uh, continues all the way down to a little building we call a carrier neutral location or a CNL. And the, the carrier neutral location is, is kind of the key here. And, and this is where a lot of our focus has been. The CNL is a little, it's either a prefab building or it's a remodeled room in an existing public building. The, the key here is neutrality. It is, it's a place where the middle mile networks, the long haul networks meet the last mile networks, the networks that go from a central location, you know, to your home or business. Um, it's not owned by your competitor. So, so historically co-location in these environments, these small environments has been done in a Bell Central office. Well, that requires an interconnection agreement and it requires ordering uh, procedures. It, it requires access procedures. It requires fairly high cost of, you know, cableless peering and or cableless co-location and power distribution. And it's just a lot of hurdles and time and cost to do that in a Bell CO. So we kind of took a page out of the cell site models and said, let's give them a place to put their equipment and let's give them easy access to upstream services and let's reduce those barriers. So if you go into a commercial inline access hut, you know, an ILA along a long haul route, those carriers will charge you everywhere from $1,500 to $2,000 per month to, to just have a quarter rack of equipment in those ILAs. We charge $250 per month to have a half rack or even a full rack, depending on the site, in these carrier neutral locations. So we're really trying to lower the barrier of entry for those ISPs in the communities to invest in fiber to the home, better wireless and mobile services. Are, are there any regulations that, that govern what you're just describing that people have to look out for? Or or the or or is this just because you're outside of the telco situation? It's it's whatever uh, whatever works. Yeah, we're we're not operating on the regulated side of the telco, and you know, fortunately, Title Two is it, today is not governing us. Um, we're not seeing a uh, we're in the net neutrality cast a long shadow, and it would have had effects on this. But in this mm -hmm. case, for our purposes, it, it's a positive that we don't have that that layer of regulation over overseeing us. We have, we have simple building codes, right? So electrical, plumbing, yep. you know, structural, fire, that kind of thing. And we do a lot of work around each of those. But but these carrier neutral locations are, are largely, they, they literally are an unregulated environment. Um, we, we put in dual air conditioning. We put a generator outside. Uh, three of the racks here, there's a total of five racks. Three of them are, you know, loosely allocated for last mile ISBs. To, to co-locate or lease that space. And two of the racks are, are intended for middle mile services, such as Region 10. If we can get in a Zeo, a Lumen, you know, the, the next guy there, we have a regional one called Fast Track. If we can get any of those guys in to give our ISPs additional network options, we encourage that. We're not trying to create a closed proprietary system. That neutrality piece in, in you know, non-discriminatory interconnection, availability of space, availability of upstream services, those really go deep with us in that we want to make sure we're lowering those barriers and giving those ISPs choices to make their services better. Cool. So, so Corey, what type of, you mentioned these were shared public spaces. What, like what, give an example of what type of building that you look for when you bring these together. Sure, sure. So generally we're looking for a footprint that's roughly 10 by 20, 10 feet by 20 feet. So that, that gives us the ability to put five racks in place and have ADA uh, you know, level access around the racks. So, so 42, 46 inches front and back to, of the racks. The one on the left here is in Ridgeway, Colorado, kind of down near Ure. Um, that's a prefab building. So that looks a lot like a, a cell site shelter. Uh, fiber cement walls, um, basically put the racks in it. It's got a concrete floor. That's a, sitting on a, um, a public works yard so, so the county in that case donated the land, gave us the location. We put a vault outside. So that's a prefab building. On the right, this is actually the back of the Telluride School District. So huh. Telluride Ski cool. Area would be to your right. This They had built a theater, and the theater had some dead zones, some empty space in back. And, and behind the photographer in this picture, up uphill, there's actually a significant threat of, of boulders <laughs> rolling down the hill. And there's some big chain fences mitigating that. But um, they didn't want students in around this area. So we had um, 
we were able to get access to this space. And if you go through that door to the right, there's a roughly 15 by, by 20 space. And that's got similar racks in that. So that was a remodel of a public space that a school district owned and worked with the county. And the one on the left was a, the prefab site. So we're typically looking for a municipality, a county, a fire district. You know, schools are historically kind of the more challenging environment to work with, but this one did work out. Um, just because schools, you know, their focus is, is educating kids and safety and, and that type well, of thing. They'll get great internet access if they let you in there. <laughs> They do, yes, and, and our route into tell we now are just in the process of activating four 100 gig links on fiber into Telluride, which will be an absolute game changer for Telluride. Wow. Sweet. So, um, so, so kind of what does the inside of that little building look like? Um, this is kind of a bird's eye view, the floor plan. On the right, we've got the, the last mile racks for the providers, the ladder, ladders and trays over the top. On the left, we've got the racks for the middle mile, and typically one of those is Region 10, and one of those is whoever we can kind of tease into the CNL to, to work with us there. Uh, dual air conditioning, so that the air, if the air, one air conditioner fails, the other stays up. Um, we do have a fiber termination rack here, and that's so that all the cabling comes into one location. Um, we put the fiber loops on the wall, but we try to terminate everything in patch panels, uh, trying to reduce you know things to catch or touch. Or that kind of stuff, yeah. Yeah, overhead LED lighting. Um, we we do put IP cameras and key card locks. So, and I always use this example: if someone is in there working and they drop a ladder and it affects someone else's rack, we want to see what happened and, and get better at not dropping ladders or, or triaging it if it happens. Um, you know, th those types of anomalies. People generally don't sk steal telecom gear. It's not a, a security threat as far as theft. It's more just management things. And then we have a power panel. Um, some of the larger ones you'll see have an A and B power panel, and um, we have a generator outside. So it's it's this is actually a, a floor plan that's going into a parking garage in a ski area here in Crested Butte. Um, hmm. So the the other one I can show you. Um, do you. Do you have challenges getting power in there to these things? I mean, how much you know are you doing two hundred amps into that in that little room, or are you like how do you size it? for to make sure those three racks of ISP stuff have plenty of juice. Yeah, we start out with about 200 amps and and it's all um two phase. We don't do any three phase power here. This is all AC by the way. Um yep. so we're not doing a DC rectifier or a DC plant. Um if we do have regen sites out there that have DC power plants, but those are leased facilities for us. Um now everything here is AC. We bring in, you know, line power. We have had a couple occasions where the electrical company has had to upgrade transformers or pull out the line going into a building and replace that if it's old mm -hmm. and not sufficiently sized. We don't want to heat them up. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, it's but it's networking gear, right? I mean, it, it's spinning fans. It's a little bit larger than it used to be, but it's not big banks of service. But you're not We're building not. a data center, basically. I mean, you have, you know, three three racks of stuff in there. I mean, you know. If we'll, you're pulling we'll 200 some... amps of juice through that, that's that's a lot of stuff. Yeah, we'll get some occasional servers placed in these for management and that type of thing, but you're not looking at high density here as far as power draw. Mm. Um, cool. This is a, lar a larger site. This is going into Durango and, and a similar one into Grand Junction. Um, this is just physically a little bit bigger, and it's got eight cabinets instead of racks. We have more ISPs in that region. Just It, it serves a larger area. And it's got, same thing, dual HVAC, uh, two points of entry here for the fiber, so there's re redundancy. And then everything else is basically the same, uh, two power panels and LED lighting on top. And to the right here, this is a list of our existing and, and some of the CNLs we're working on. I think there's a few more that than, than that are in there. But, but these facilities really give the community a first project that they can do. It's a construction project, so it's not a high hurdle as far as technology. It makes an immediate difference to the ISPs. And once we build these carrier neutral locations or even announce that we're looking into it, I've got a group of ISPs that are right on my tail. Um, they want leases, they wanna be in there, they wanna size up that potential market. Can we take private and public capital to, to invest in that community and obtain subscribers? So these companies are, are moving pretty quickly. So, gears on, on what goes into the CNL and, and why. Um, so, so we've got kind of this shaded gray box here. 
And the people we're trying to convince to come into this facility are the fiber to the home player. You know, it, that could be in, in improving an HFC plant, that could be a new greenfield build. Uh, we also want to serve the fixed wireless guys because in a lot of our rural areas, fixed wireless is is the way to, to reach homes and businesses where there's a, a very difficult uh, case for, for, for wireline services. And, and at the end of the day, we really want to get the mobile cellular folks in here and we're talking to several of them. You know, having 35 mini facilities on net with fiber, with redundancy and capacity, that's just like low hanging fruit for- That's awesome for backhaul, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, the community anchors are sitting out here and, and they typically have kind of a dotted line for them. We want these guys, the city, county, healthcare, education, uh, public safety, we really prefer them to come in under the ISPs. We don't wanna come in and cherry pick these, these high revenues targets. And the ISPs will pay us for co-location and upstream services naturally, so it's, it's a fit. The ISPs are set up to do billing, truck rolls, support calls, all the end user services, and we're really set up in a wholesale model. So but the other piece that's interesting here is that on the upstream piece, you know, we've got some optical equipment that sends the signals east and west. We've, we've got an edge router that um, makes traffic decisions. It just, it's a BGP edge basically, and we can run LSPs and, and do direct peering from that edge router into these ISPs. All the things outside of that shaded gray box are, are generally public dollars. It's a mix of local, state, and federal. Everything in the shaded gray box is, is mostly private dollars with a little public support occasionally. We are really using the public dollar to support and not compete with the private entities. So. It's a little bit of a change from what we saw 10 years ago where, where the public dollar attempted to go after those community anchors and, and really kind of silo those, those efforts. We really are working hard to integrate and support the private industry, not, not yeah, to Yeah, this is really, you're right. I mean, this is, uh, you know, if we remember the broadband debacle from the, you know, the, the kind of the early 2000s or whatever, and it was what you're describing, like public dollars went to telcos, to basically shut out ISPs that were trying to do competitive DSL <laughs> because the facility was owned by the telco and they, you know, they put all kinds of hurdles in the way. This is the exact opposite, right? Yeah. And we've just kind of learned, we, we've just kind of learned that, that the lessons of the past and that that simply doesn't work. Um, it, it's not, um, hold on guys, one second. Okay, um, it, we've learned the lessons of the past. We've kind of figured out that, you know, those those things just don't work. And once you create that competitive situation, you know, it doesn't end well for, for anybody. So the idea is to have this be cooperative and, and, and really support them. And, and at the end of the day, we've been able to do that. We've got a group of ISPs that want to be in these facilities um, and work with us. And they know that we don't compete with them. Um, you know, occasionally a government customer will come to us and say, we've supported you this, this long. Can you please, you know, it's not working out with XYZ ISP. We'd like to work with you directly. And, you know, some higher education customers do that. But mm -hmm. but just to review kind of the, the three areas here where we're either buying access to or constructing that middle mile fiber along the long haul routes, building that lateral into the town and working with the town to do that, and then creating these carrier neutral lo locations. That's that's kind of the secret Those sauce. Those are the three keys here, yeah. And this is URA where we built the, the 47 miles down into URA and they've got fiber, two fiber to the home ISPs competing in this town today. And you're looking cool. at Red Mountain Pass leaving there. So, yeah, that's the interesting thing that you're doing here too, is, is that, you know, which is opposite from that, you know, telco mm -hmm. stranglehold, stranglehold on, you know, basically the local access situation. Um, you know, you're actually, you're actually creating a space, um, for competition to happen in the area too, which is, you know, back to the net neutrality thing and all that. I mean, that's a big reason to do this, right? You're not doing this because you're a nice guy, <laughs> you know, it's, well, it's a, you are, but I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's, it, there's actually a business case here yeah. that makes a lot of sense. We're you trying know. to influence where the investment occurs and get it to not just go to the places that are lucrative, to, but to the places that have yeah, exactly. a need. Um, the competition question is interesting because I, I go into some areas where introducing competition is very disruptive and, and they resist, you know, actively, politically, otherwise. Yep. Um, 
and then other places where there, there's no hint of competition and we don't even get resistance from the cable co or telco because they'd prefer to have sold off those markets years ago um you know it's, it's provider of last resort that, that keeps them present that type of thing so this is entirely unregulated and it's just focused on internet access and you know more and more you're seeing all your services from life safety all the way down to entertainment and commerce education and healthcare moving over these public networks so wow this is cool so you know brent maybe you should look into doing this in your uh your neck of the woods because <laughs> yeah man let me uh let me let me let me hire 50 attorneys to you've been uh, taking some the, notes yeah like the local <laughs> Local Lex and uh, yeah, I mean that is kind Colorado, of a problem, competitive too. state where there's uh, there's plenty of money to be spent. It's a little different than I, yeah, I well, that's kind of the problem. Is the like Corey brought this up on the first call, uh, the first session we had where there was actually a law that prohibited uh, formation of, of other ISPs effectively, right? Well, munis have been and you know on that across the board, yeah. That's that's really the wrong place to start from, right? On this. <laughs> well, what's what's fascinating to me is that you you have all these last mile providers coming in once the once the backhaul's there. So I think that's pretty unique. Uh, I don't know if there's like a density thing there, but I, like, I don't. Well, see there's how business they, to be had, and they're they making want the business case for it in, in that you know? sparse of a location. But that's yeah, what no. suddenly tips the business case, right? If you if you subtract off all that stuff Corey was just talking about, you know, the build part and the paperwork part, as they call it, that's, that's I mean, significant. It's, it still doesn't, right? it still doesn't make the numbers too, too sparsely. Dense and that's it. Just the know, numbers uh, just don't uh, work. Don't yeah. It's, it's how, kind of, how do they, how do they justify it, Corey? I, I think like, that if you look at the CapEx versus the OpEx, you know, the CapEx is the initial investment you've got to amortize over time where you've got some to find in these cases, we're addressing market failures, so you have to find some public support to, to do the CapEx side of it. And, and that's there, and you're seeing that increase. But on the OpEx side, that's what really helps the companies sustain, right? So we're largely affecting their OpEx. Um, we're giving them a hedge. We're giving them the ability to stay in that market and sustain, uh, continue their operations, and, and hopefully make a buck. We want them to be successful. Yeah, it's so cost-effective. They, they reinvest, right? They'll, they'll have to upgrade those networks in a number of years. So those dollars have to be around. So, so we're working on that side of the PL that's the hardest for a regional ISP to, to manage. We're, we're doing that kind of, I wouldn't say for them, but, but on their behalf, um, where they typically would have to go out and, and spend time. They're, they're much more comfortable. They're much more um, happy investing their time, resources, energy on the customer facing side that brings them revenue than the liability side. Short-term revenue immediately. Yeah. That's more of a, you know, and more of a longer-term investment. And then, you know, I'm doing, I'm in budget food fight season right now myself. And I, I could tell you that this, like, this is very apropos because what happens at a telco is, you know, and I did this when I was at BT when we were trying to run fiber to, to the homes um, there. And, it's really, it, it comes down to the entire business case. And if you can just lop off the whole transport part and just make it this cost, not all this stuff, which then has, you know, lots of analysis, you know, then the telcos have a whole process for how they do this too, which Corey has short-circuited the whole thing and made it vastly more simple. Yeah. Um, we've been a little that innovative. also helps your business case, right? Yeah, and we've we've been a little innovative too. So some of the products that we're offering these regional ISPs, when they occupy or, or invest in multiple communities, we're able to come up with like a, a shared service, right? So we do transport for them. We also do the upstream peering for them. And the so peering have, part, yep. And I've taken a hundred gig circuit, you know, in one case, and given that multiple drops. So they they buy a single hundred gig circuit. We do it almost like an old EPL would have been or, or multi-site VPN and and we drop them in three, four different locations as well as those tail locations. So they do that and then mirror that with upstream peering with, from us. So they're buying from other ISPs as well as us. Um, and the traditional telco model for what you just described would probably be three individual runs with three individual management setups and blah, 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 right? I mean, it's at least two times more expensive than what you're talking about. Yeah, so so we're trying to affect that cost curve in a positive way, you know, on their behalf. Cool. Yeah. Any other questions, comments, guys? 
before we get going. All right. Well, we'll call it a call it a day. Thanks again, Corey, for uh, being on the net, and uh, thank you all for listening. We'll see you on the next one. Thanks a lot. And, uh, Thanks, Corey. Thank <laughs> you.